Marijuana has been a controlled substance in Canada since 1923, but polls show a majority of Canadians believe pot should be legal, and the new Trudeau government has pledged to legalize, regulate, and restrict access to marijuana. What are the health risks and benefits of cannabis, and what might legalization do to its rate of use and to the industry that produces the plant? Hello, I'm Jackie Rourke. On this episode, McGill Talks Marijuana. Joining me to discuss, Dr. Mark Ware is Associate Professor in the McGill Department of Family Medicine and the Department of Anesthesiology. He's Executive Director of the Canadian Consortium for the Investigation of Cannabinoids. He's also Director of Clinical Research at the Allen Edwards Pain Management Unit at the MUHC and an active member of the McGill Department of Family Medicine. Ken Lester is an adjunct professor of finance, teaching investment and behavioral finance at the Hotel Faculty of Management at McGill. Ken is CEO at Lester Asset Management. There's just overwhelming and growing scientific and medical evidence about the uh, bad long-term effects of marijuana. We've spent uh, a couple of generations uh, trying to reduce the usage of tobacco in Canada uh, with a lot of success. Tobacco is a product that does a lot of damage. Marijuana is uh, infinitely worse. Well, is it? Is cannabis, marijuana, infinitely worse than tobacco? I don't think there's a single metric that you can use that can prove that that statement is true. It's clearly not infinitely worse than tobacco. In fact, in many, many ways, cannabis is far safer than tobacco. I think that's an extremely uninformed opinion. Well, let's, I want to start with some rapid-fire questions, Mark. You're, you're one of Canada's leading experts, if not the leading expert on medical marijuana. Let's get a few things out of the way, starting off. Cannabis, is it addictive? So quick answer is yes. There are people who have a hard time controlling their cannabis use, especially if they start using it early and if they use a lot of it. So, you know, teenagers, early adolescents, this is a high risk period for any uh, substance abuse and it it's holds true for cannabis. Um, that said, uh, you can look at cannabis addiction as a proportion of the people who use it versus the number of people who then develop uh, problem use as a result. And cannabis is much less addictive than a number of other substances like tobacco, alcohol, nicotine, coffee, um, these are all far less addictive when it comes to the proportion of people using it who develop problems. So it, it can be. There's no way to suggest that it doesn't have uh, a, a risk of abuse, but for the mo vast majority of people who are late onset users and who use it into middle age and adolescence, they, or middle age and adulthood, they do not qualify for definitions of addiction to the drug. Okay. Is it carcinogenic? As far as we know, it's not. Uh, they've looked very carefully at long-term smokers of cannabis over 20 plus years and some very heavy long-term smokers. The difficulty with uh, trying to figure out the risk of cannabis smoking and cancer is that it's almost always confounded with tobacco. People either mix tobacco with the cannabis or the hashish or the, the whatever they're making, the whatever they're rolling, um, or they smoke tobacco along with the cannabis. What about smoke. the smoking part of it though? De there are definitely carcinogens in the smoke and it's peculiar because for a long time people thought for sure there had to be a risk. They couldn't demonstrate. Once you controlled for tobacco use there was no evidence and to this day there's no strong evidence that cannabis use by itself even smoked in large quantities causes lung cancer or upper airway cancers or mouth cancers. The difficulty is teasing out the effect of tobacco. I saw a study 2006 saying that in fact it looked like it might actually have some protective properties. Uh, that's another fascinating piece of the story. The cannabinoids themselves look like they have these anti-tumor properties. Certainly in animal models, in cell cultures, there is some ed evidence suggesting that THC and the, the other ingredients may have this ability to take cancer cells and cause them to die, cause them to die off, or to restrict blood supply to tumor cells that are spreading. Uh, this hasn't been shown in human studies, but it's one of the reasons why people think that cannabis use may may actually kind of protect people against developing. So potentially there's a tumor developing in the airways, but that the cannabinoids actually sort of knock that out. The bottom line is in the large scale population studies, the, the risk does not appear to be certainly nowhere near as bad as tobacco. I, I'm aware of that study too, Mark. And isn't it, uh, isn't there po possibly part of the rationale is that the, the, the body of people who do use cannabinoids are people who generally are healthier and 
perhaps take care of themselves in other ways better than the average population. So it could be, a, rather than a symptom, it could be a, a reflection of the fact. Uh, sure. We, we talk about the research that's been done on cannabis over the last 80 years and, and why do we have this perspective that it's so dangerous and infinitely harmful. We have to remember that cannabis research has all been conducted under a paradigm of prohibition. It's always been an illegal substance. The funding bodies that have been funding cannabis research have been looking for negative effect, looking for addiction and cancer and risks and driving accidents and so on. All of that work has built up a body of evidence that is completely unbalanced by any possible suggestion that the drug might have benefits or might have some positive health effects. Does it cause brain damage? Certainly initially when, when it was first uh, outlawed in Canada, 1923, it, was, it drove people insane. You know, does it cause mental illness or does it in fact help some conditions? Again, a difficult question to answer quickly. Uh, cannabis use when done acutely, when you first use or inhale or smoke cannabis, there's clearly a psychoactive effect. That causes some impairment, it slows down your reaction time, it impairs your short-term memory. There are, there are effects on the brain which happen in the short term and for, you know, that's why people do it. It, it affects their brain and most of them and find the experience positive. Um, but that said, if, if you have a risk for developing a psychosis illness, schizophrenia, and you're at the right age group, uh, cannabis use has been shown to be associated with unmasking that mental illness. So the, the quick answer is yes, it can, um, but there are people who appear to be at risk of developing this this complication. Clearly not everybody who's used cannabis has gone on to become psychotic or schizophrenic. We haven't seen increases in the rates of schizophrenia over the last 40 years that would suggest that while the population is using cannabis much more often uh, that we're seeing this increase. It's been stable for 40 years. Um, so we really need to find out who are these kids that are at risk and help to identify them early and say listen you are a group of people who really shouldn't be doing this drug. Family history of schizophrenia, family history of psychotic illnesses, um, these are the kinds of things to look for. There may be genetic factors as well, um, but clearly not everybody, uh, but there are, some, uh, there are some at risk. And then you get into the less sort of dangerous uh, mental illnesses, not so much psychosis, but bipolar disease, anxiety, depression. And yes, there are some people for whom this drug makes things worse, but we have a lot of reports of people who make it, who report that it makes their depression, their anxiety, their PTSD, their other mental health symptoms actually improves the, their ability to manage you deal things. with a lot of patients who so, deal with that. What have you seen? Well, I deal with patients with chronic pain, which is, of course is associated with a lot of anxiety, depression, and, and sometimes much more serious mental illnesses as well. Um, and what we find is that the drug has this, um, what I call a, a broad spectrum effect. It seems, seems to somehow help with the pain, but also with the anxiety, helps sometimes with sleep. Uh, it can help with some of the, f the functional limitations that they feel, spasticity and so on. So for the patients who are genuinely using the drug medically, there are multiple improvements in many dimensions uh, of their lives, which which seem to contribute to the overall sense of well-being that they get. Can you deal with the, sort of the economic aspects of uh, cannabis and marijuana? Uh, when I hear Mark talk, I think, oh, those pharmaceutical companies don't want something you, you grow in your backyard tackling important mm -hmm. things like arthritis and chronic pain. What's their role in all of this? And where do you th see things going if Canada legalizes it? What will the pharmaceutical industries be doing? Hmm. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I think marijuana is one of those uh, plants that it's very easy to grow badly or sort of, you know, sort of in large quantities or, you know, it's a weed after all, it grows very quickly, but it's very difficult and, and time consuming and, and, and uh, involves a, a high degree of expertise to grow it well to, you know, especially when we're talking about medicinal marijuana, the, the, the companies in Canada now that, that provide the medicinal marijuana um, are very, uh, are getting very good and get better at uh, actually speci you know, specifying so certain plants good for sleep disorder, certain plants good for appetite enhancement, certain plants good for glaucoma and you know things like that so they're able to actually um, probably through you know um, genetic engineering and some cross fertilization and whatever they're able to really grow specific plants for, for specific maladies and so on so I, that is something that you know you know our children in their backyard and stuff can't do so the pharmaceutical companies absolutely have a lot of uh, a lot to work with and a lot of upside in terms of the specialty and and the concentrations and so on not only that but the standardization is very important so uh, and Mark and I have talked about this before that uh, there's variations even within the bud of a particular uh, plant so 
it's, uh, you know, we, we have a long way to go before we can sort of, uh, you know, really maximize the benefits. And so so, so for, fam for farmers, the small, sort of the, the small farmers that have been providing medical marijuana, are they just going to get eaten up by larger corporations? It's a bit of a crystal ball I'm asking. It's a, yeah, it's a very good question. And interestingly, they seem to be the only ones complaining about the fact that marijuana, we're on the verge of legalization, uh, certainly in the States and in Canada, and, and probably the rest of the world will follow. So uh, the only complaints you hear are from the, you know, the people who've been doing it beforehand, saying, oh, now the government's going to regulate us, and now we're going to have to fall, jump through all these hoops. And what the thinking is now is that the big companies, the, uh, the Philip Morrises, the, you know, are going to start buying up these marijuana companies. So that's why they're, everybody's buying the marijuana companies, thinking, okay, the big boys are going to come along, and rather than reinvent the wheel and have to go through. And by the way, the um, Canada doesn't hand out licenses very readily. And in fact, I, I don't know how many there are out there, maybe 20 or 26, so, 26. And, uh, and pretty much there's almost like a moratorium, I think, on new licenses. So uh, when a big boy wants to get in, big company, big you know, pharma wants to get in, involved in this space, the way to do it would be to buy uh, an existing company. But I think there'll still be a need for the, uh, the traditional growers as and well. And there's, there's all kinds of other industries associated with this plant. I mean, it's an industrial tech textile, ropes, uh, biomass for biofuels, um, edible products. Absolutely. Clothing. I mean, uh, uh, the hemp industry is huge. How big is, is the industry? You know, hemp used to be the biggest cash crop in North America until, I'm not sure, I think until the end of the 19th century. And uh, of course, the big thing was for boats, for sailing, the ropes. And I think a lot of the uh, sails and stuff were made out of hemp. So hemp Which was Which have been a, found 100 years later underwater. Mm -hmm. And still intact. It's still intact. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it is... Uh, it's got so many uses. I mean, it really is such a wonderful plant on you know many so levels. So does legalizing affect all those industries as well? Have they well, been hampered by? Yeah, the I think what happened was uh, they had to find alternatives. So rather than growing hemp to make the ropes, which was the optimal um, you know sort of material to start with, they had to because of all the complications of it being an you know controlled substance, they had to look elsewhere and find. Uh, so now maybe if it is completely legalized, they would go back to hemp. Uh, I'm not sure because maybe some of the substitutes they found are, are just as good or better. I, I, I'm not really an expert in that area. Maybe important to point out that in Canada, we've had a legal hemp industry for about 20 years now. Hemp, hemp was legalized for, for and there are 60,000 hectares of hemp growing in Canada now. The problem is that it's until recently, it's been completely illegal in the US. I want to talk about teens in particular. A 2013 report by UNICEF concluded that Canadian children between the ages of 11 and 15 are the heaviest users of cannabis in the developed world. In 29 nations, 28% of 11 to 15 year olds said that they had used cannabis in the past 12 months. Meanwhile, countries that have legalized or decriminalized it, uh, Portugal, the Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, uh, Italy, their rates are either half that of Canada's or a third less. So impact on teens from a health point of view and from a use point of view, where do we think that's going to go? First of all, the health point of view for teenagers. Is that really something that we need to be very concerned about as much as we're not as concerned about the health impacts for adults? The teenage developing brain is a very sensitive structure. It's a very important one. Teenagers are going through a tremendous range of different experiences, hormonal, they're growing, they're experiencing a lot of life changes as they go on. This is not the time to be dampening or hampering that process with, with large amounts of cannabis. So, and I think it gets back to the age of onset. The earlier people are exposed to this appears to be when the problems start to develop. If we could wait, if we could convince our teenagers to wait until they use cannabis until they're 18 or later, um, the risks on the developing brain are, are, are so much lower. So I think in any new policy, that's going to be a major effort. Speaking to those stats those um, that you mentioned, uh, like the Netherlands and mm -hmm. Italy having lower rate of, uh, I think it's the same thing with alcohol. In, effect, in fact, in Europe where, you know, when you sit down at a table, wine's broad and everything, you know, there you see young, there, there's lo way lower alcoholism in Europe. So where it's more available, there's less abuse by young children. So I think it's absolutely the forbidden fruit. I mean, a, a young person that wants to do something just because it's bad, if you want it, you can find it now. And so I don't think there are people who are looking for it who can't get it, let's put it that way. And I, so I don't think that legalizing it will all of a sudden increase the usage amongst that, that group. I mean, there are certainly adults probably who would want to try it but are staying away because it's illegal. Certainly lawyers and you know judges. What do you envision our society looking like? Are we going to have new coffee shops on the corner like they have in the Netherlands? Or? Uh, 
I envision it like uh, like the SAQ. I mean, I think it'll be a controlled, uh, taxed, and you know that's what makes the government so interested. And that's why I I really think all you have to do is look at gambling. You know, gambling is a very similar kind of process because gambling also was considered you know the devil's workshop, and you know it's having fun without God involved. And so let's stay away from that. Uh, not to mention gambling is, I mean, uh, lotteries are probably the most regressive taxes on this planet because it's poor people who buy lottery tickets, of course. But what happened was gambling at first was, you know, nowhere. And then, okay, Vegas will have that one sort of, you know, devil's place where everybody who has to do it goes there. It's sort of like in, in Amsterdam, it's the same thing. They're actually quite conservative. There's, if you have to do that ugly stuff, Their go- Their rates of use go, are very low. Yeah, go to, go to these coffee houses, you know, we don't want to see you yeah, doing it. Yeah. Go, go do it over there. So that was the Vegas thing. And then Atlantic City and then state by state they realize wait a minute we're foregoing all this revenue because everybody's going to Vegas and then you know making in Nevada and you know in New Jersey rich so then state by state they also I think that's what's gonna happen here we see now with Colorado we see with Washington Oregon so there we see the money that they're making well, that's my next question so what are we looking at in terms of, of money in terms of tax revenue? Well, what will the market bear? Right now, the market is paying a huge premium because it's illegal. So essentially, we're paying, anybody who's buying marijuana today is, is paying for the transportation, is paying for hiding from the cops, is paying for the few who get busted and have to pay you know, these huge fines and so on. So uh, when you lift that premium, you know, what, is, what would it actually cost if it was not illegal and you know, uh, um, probably 10% of what you know, the market's paying for now. So theoretically, if what the market price is today in this illegal environment uh, is, uh, is sort of uh, doable financially for, you know, in terms of how much, the, how much of our money can go towards something like this, then that 90% could be taxes instead of, you know, going into, mm -hmm. you know, underworld and, and, you know, and paying for- And then there's also these cost savings of law enforcement. I mean, the statistics on law enforcement related to cannabis in Canada and the U.S. Is, is, it is staggering for, for what they get and that the vast majority, it's either 1% or 10%, depending on who you believe, actually go to prosecution. So there's an enormous effort to bust people, but it never really goes anywhere in court. We're going to get cost savings from less law enforcement related to? Uh, it has to be. I mean, there's, you know, huge budgets there, not to mention the ill feelings with other countries and so on, where you know, here we blame Mexico, we're the users, and, and you know, and yet we go in and, and you know, blame Mexico for, for growing it. And so, yeah, absolutely. I think it'll, there'll be a lot of savings, a lot of social and sort of cap, political capital savings on top of the financial savings. Uh, but of course, there's a whole whack of people who believe that more people smoking marijuana is going to create more problems, either <clears throat> driving while intoxicated. Huh. You know, Mark said it before that uh, so far all the studies have been done by basically right-wing groups trying to find reasons, you know, faults with it so that they can say, aha, you know. So I always say, have, have they ever found one guy who smoked a joint and then killed his wife or one guy who smokes a joint and goes postal? They would love that kind of thing, you know, but they, it, it, it doesn't exist. You know, I, from my understanding, you, you smoke a joint, you want to lie on a couch and, you know, listen to Hendrix music or something. There isn't the, you know, so I think in terms of, uh, you know, concerning concerns about society, if people switched from alcohol to, to marijuana, I'm sure it would be a good thing for everybody. I mean, for society, it has to be. Well, there's a lot of studies that still need to be done. You've said that many times, Mark, and you've uh, established the Quebec Cannabis Registry. Tell us about that. And is it, it's a volunteer registry? So the Quebec Cannabis Registry was set up because we had a legal framework for medical users <coughs> to access cannabis coming from standardized, quality-controlled supply. So we now had an opportunity to actually track patients who are using cannabis as part of their therapy using a standard known supply, and we could observe and watch them over time and see what kinds of health effects they had or didn't have, so effects on their symptoms but also side effects. We will be able to track over time people who are using cannabis in the same way that we now know people using alcohol, there are certain levels, and most people know that a certain number of units of alcohol per week, a glass of wine every night is not likely to be harmful. In fact, there is suggestion that it could be beneficial for heart disease and so on. These studies emerge all the time, but the only way we know that is because people can honestly report how much they drink or how much they smoke or they exercise and so on. And by following those patients, very large cohorts of patients, we can actually determine what the public health impact of the disease is, of the drug is. And I think with a regulated cannabis model, we will actually be able to start looking. And we won't have answers for several years, but we will be able to see, does it impact 
uh, student attendance at high school? Does it impact driving accidents? Does it impact rates of alcohol abuse? Does it impact rates of opioid use? And we're beginning to see already, coming out of the US states where they've had medical and recreational uh, legalization models, we're already beginning to get some of these metrics. It's, it's a little early to re be conclusive, but we're starting to at least see that there doesn't seem to be signs that there is a huge spike in traffic accidents, a huge spike in fatalities, a huge spike in school dropouts. And so a these are some spike. of the sociological things, but <laughs> what are right. some of the medical health things about cannabis that we still don't know that you would like to find out? Part of the things that I think need to be looked at are the, the uh, Cannabis users tend to be clustered very much at, at, at adolescence and teenager. There's a, there's a huge proportion, you know, 40 to 50 percent of Canadians will have used cannabis at some point in their early adult life, but then the numbers drop off dramatically. And they, you, know, you get down to around 10 percent of Canadians, maybe less, who are regular, maybe not frequently, but infrequent cannabis users for the rest of their adult lives. I'd love to know who those people are. Is it because they just like the drug so much? Is it because they have a dependency problem? Or is it because they're actually selecting themselves because it actually does something for them that other substances don't do. They, it helps them with anxiety, it helps them with a little bit of ADD or some mild symptoms that just helps them manage and function. And I think we have a window of you know, what I call the functional cannabis user. Who are these people that have been using cannabis illegally up until now for years and are functioning as high levels of society, whether they be doctors or finance managers or politicians or lawyers or journalists. There is an enormous number of people out there who continue to use the drug who are hidden from our view right now. Allowing people access to a clean and stable drug, even if they're dependent on it. We see this with the safe injection sites right. and with the Naomi Needle. trials and so on, needle exchanges. Having an approach where you treat p people who have substance abuse disorders as a medical problem, not a legal one, allows us to help those pay people find help, find treatment, find access to something that's clean that allows them to s avoid the harms. The harms often with these drugs are not so much about the, the drug itself, it's the illicit nature of the drug that goes with it. Right. The fact money, that stealing money, stealing money to pay for it, the, the, mm. the, the doctoring of the drugs with other things to make them uh, cheaper for the, for the, uh, the illicit market to sell them. So th that's a huge discussion going on. A cannabis is one small piece of that. It's also one of the most widely used illegal drug on the planet. So there's an enormous pipeline of cannabis trade going on along with that. While you're shipping bundles of hashish and cannabis around, you've got room to tuck in a few packages of kilos of of cocaine and heroin. So when you take those pipelines out, what then happens to the, the drug trafficking? The other big part, and this is in your area, Ken, is the money laundering that goes with all of this. He, billions and billions of dollars of revenue coming into the black market with the illicit sale of cannabis all has to be cleaned somewhere. It has to be put into something to get itself cleaned out. It's as big as the industry itself is the money laundering that goes along with it. So the, the, I think nobody should be in any way fooled that cannabis legalization is an easy process. It has its tentacles in an enormous number of different parts of society. And if Justin Trudeau is going to do this well and do this right, he's going to need to take some time to make sure as much as possible he's identified all of the areas. And we've talked about the justice system, we've talked about the schools, we've talked about the health system. Uh, we need to put in place a really carefully s structured system of monitoring what this has. In some ways, it's the ultimate clinical trial. Lots of people aren't comfortable with smoking it, and edibles are the big thing now, and that's going to explode. Tell us a little bit about edibles, the impact, the effect, how do they differ? Well, cannabis, as you know, is a, is, is a plant. The active ingredients are oily structures, um, and they need to be heated to be active. So the reason people smoke or bake or cook is that the molecules in the cannabis plant have to be decarboxylated to get fancy. They have to be <coughs> treated in some way that allows them to become psychoactive. That process of heating is critical. So vaporization has become an, a substitute for cannabis smoking. It heats the, the materials to a temperature that they don't burn, but that they come off in a vapor which you can then inhale. It's kind of like the e-cigarettes that people are very uh, popular or that are very popular now. Is that safer? That can all be done. Well, we think so. At least in theory, there are less of the toxins, there are less of the tars, there are less of the polyaromatics that are associated with smoke, the carbon-related substances. But 
the problem is we don't know what the, they, in order to extract those oils from the plant, they need to use some kind of vehicle. They need to use a, another oil, alcohol, butane, naphtha. Mm -hmm. There are all kinds of ways, super critical CO2 extraction techniques. So this is where that industry is moving now, is how do we efficiently extract those compounds from the plant? Um, and I think that's a huge industry that's waiting to, 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 to jump on this. And now, again, the Supreme Court just this summer has allowed the companies in Canada that are licensed to grow for medical purposes to develop oils and extracts. And I think this is going to be an area to be very, to watch very carefully. Mm. If I could just add that uh, after conversations with several CEOs of these uh, medical marijuana companies, um, the, the other hurdle they have is a lot of doctors will not prescribe it because of the smoking aspect. They, they, they say, I, you know, I know ma marijuana is good for my patient, but I just can't, you know, prescribe something that has to be smoked. So. If, if they can find a different delivery system that avoids smoking, the, 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 the sort of the penetration amongst doctors, they think, will be much greater. It brings Making up a really good point. Medical marijuana, will it still exist after it's legalized? Mm -hmm. will, will someone who wants to use it still talk to their doctor about it if they don't need the... Uh, the license to, to use anymore? That's a, that's a million dollar question in more ways than one. I don't know that the legalization of cannabis will eliminate the medical need. There are clearly people who use this drug for medical purposes and will continue to need it. And I would hope that Canadian physicians, and if we're talking about Canada specifically, will, will still be able to have those conversations with patients. But uh, I think that for patients who need prescriptions, that's going to require clinical trials. It's going to require probably an effort to get the cost of the drug covered by formularies. I think that's going to be the key piece to that. Doctors have been hesitant. They don't. They feel they, they had no training for this. Yeah, they don't yeah. know. So they're not sure if they want to prescribe. They don't really know what they're dealing with. Do you see a day when we're going to be talking about cannabis in, in our medical school? Uh, well, at McGill, we already have cannabis in our medical school. I teach a course in pharmacology on cannabis. I think it's the only one in North America. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's coming. I think that's where we need an educated population that understands what they're doing. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you both very much for a very interesting discussion. Mark Ware, Ken Lester, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. We hope you'll join us next time. McGill Talks.